This week we're going to be talking about client-side libraries and how to include, uh, I'm going to use the term library, and when I say a library I mean some small set of functions or objects or classes that we're going to use to uh, simplify working with the DOM or we're going to use for some general purpose to extend or fill in gaps in browser versions, etc. So we've got three that we want to talk about today and I'm, I'm going to get to them in a minute, but specifically, you know, we're going to take a look at jQuery, we'll talk about Lodash, we'll talk about Moment.js and all of these libraries, before I talk about them, I want to say something about why we're looking at them. Um, I'll come back to this later, but I would say to you that all three of these libraries are older technologies. They're not going to be the focus of what we're going to do in, you know, when you're looking at front-end web development right now, like modern front-end web development, we're going to reach for tools like React, Angular, different frameworks, and so on. And a lot of these libraries are from a different era of the web. Now, they're still relevant because people still use them. And so there is millions and millions and millions, billions of web pages out there that still use these. As a result, you as a front end web developer, you can't ignore the past. You have to know everything about what the web used to do. And you also need to know what the web does now and what it's going to do, like what's coming next. So this is really tricky for web development because other platforms, what they do is they just throw out the old. A uh, new version of programming language X from some company comes out or a new version of the iPhone or something like that. They just throw out the old stuff. Okay, this is no longer supported. We no longer work on this platform. You have to have this version of the operating system or this version of whatever in order to use this. The web is totally different. The web tries to remain backward compatible forever, which means you can't cut off the past. You have to keep going with it. Okay, so before I talk about these libraries, I want to say something about ways of including libraries in front end code because it's a real mess, <laughs> partly because of the history of what I'm talking about here. So Lodash is a good example. When you go to the Lodash page, you can download Lodash uh, by clicking on one of these links. You can also go and get it from a CDN, which I'm gonna do in a second. So a CDN being, you know, like um, uh, they, they have these edge servers. So scattered all over the, over the earth geographically, they have these servers that mirror the same code. And the idea being that if I request uh, Lodash and I'm in Asia or I'm in North America or I'm in Europe, I'm going to get the closest geographic server to my location and it's going to be fast to download it. The idea used to be with CDNs that you'd be able to cache it in your browser. But something that has changed recently in the security model of the web is that uh, third party cookies, third party scripts, data from third party or cross origin, we call it. So if I'm writing something on uh, example.com, that's where my website lives and I'm loading something from somewhere else.com, that's a, that's a cross origin uh, request. I'm going across two origins there. So the security model of the web, they're tightening that down because of all kinds of problems, which I won't go into in this discussion right now, but we'll come back to later on. But anyway, cores is gonna break your heart every time you try and do anything fun with the web. If you have a good idea for the web, you can be pretty sure that it's gonna be impossible because of cores and security model of the web. Okay, so we could load it through a CDN, but this is becoming less and less um, the way that uh, people do it. So another way you can do it is you can install it from NPM. So I want to talk today about how NPM fits in with doing browser-based stuff because, you know, NPM, I thought that was for server-side stuff or for working with Node, and we're not using Node here. And then if you go down even further, there's all different module formats. So you can download Lodash as an ESM version or uh, ECMAScript module version. And they have all kinds of weird and wonderful ways that you can grab this. You can grab AMD versions of it and so on. So what I thought I would do to start is I would show you how uh, modules have evolved in JavaScript because you're gonna deal with about 
you're gonna deal, deal with at least two, but probably you're gonna deal with a bunch more different styles of, of JavaScript client-side code, and I want you to understand how they work. So what I have here, I'm gonna uh, write some code right now, and I'll throw this all up on GitHub so you can, um, you can see it. But here's what I wanna do. I've got a really simple little uh, package that I've built, and basically the only thing I've installed is Parcel. I'm gonna use Parcel. Uh, we used it in a previous video to bundle our, um, our requirements into a single bundle that we could use in the browser. So I'll come back to this because this is part of the story of what we're going to do. But essentially what I want to do is I'm going to use Lodash. I'll, I'll start off by using Lodash from a CDN. So I go to the CDN link. I'm going to um, copy this. I can actually either copy the URL or I can copy the HTML directly. And I've got a, a very basic HTML file here. What I'm going to do is at the bottom of my page, I'm going to throw it in. You want to load your JavaScript late in the loading of the page. You don't want to block the loading of the page when you have a script come in. Scripts will stop the HTML parser from running because a JavaScript can modify through things like document.write, which you should never use, uh, the contents of the page. So I'm going to load my scripts at the bottom like this, script source equal, and here's my CDN link to Lodash. So the way, the first thing that we're going to do, I'm going to use Lodash to write a, a little library of code. And what I want to be able to do is, I have another file here. Um, I have the text of The Great Gatsby. So this uh, American novel, which has just recently entered the public domain this year. And what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to take text like this and I want to be able to figure out how many characters there are in every line, which are not white space. So I don't want spaces or tabs or anything like that, but I wanna know on this line, how many characters are there? And I wanna know that for the whole file. So I'm gonna write just a little piece of code to do this. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm going to rewrite that code five different ways. I'm gonna show you the evolution of how this, these module systems work. And when I'm done that, we'll be able to look at different ways of working with JavaScript libraries, and hopefully you'll understand, uh, you'll understand what's going on. Okay, so the very first way I'm gonna write this is the wrong way. <laughs> uh, I don't want you to do this. I'm gonna put my JavaScript directly in line uh, in this HTML file. The reason that this is not a good idea is, um, First of all, your browser can't cache this JavaScript. So the browser can cache this file because it'll load it once, it'll download it, and then it can sit in cache and the cache headers that come back from uh, loading this file, they'll be able to say, all right, you're allowed to hold on to this file for a year or something like that. So I, once I download it once, I don't have to download it again for a year. But if I put JavaScript in here, it's, it, it can't be cached. And so it means that every time you load this page, you gotta load this file again. Also, I want you to think about separating as much as you can. You know, if you have JavaScript, throw it in a JavaScript file so it's easier for tools um, to work with that JavaScript code. Anyway, having said all that, let's start to write some code. So because I'm gonna be working with Lodash, I'm gonna keep the documentation for Lodash open here on the side. And I'll just quickly take you through some of the things that it lets me do. So essentially what Lodash does is it lets me uh, work with things like, you know, arrays, collections, strings, all these things in JavaScript. It gives me a bunch of extra functions. So one of the things that you're gonna run into with JavaScript is that JavaScript doesn't ship with a standard library. Like something like Java has a massive standard library. And so there's some built-in way to do everything in those languages. The web chose a different way. Uh, the web gives you a very, very low level set of primitives, and then you can build on top of it. The idea behind this is that you don't have to wait for new versions of, the, of JavaScript or new versions of the web platform to catch up for new things to happen. So people can come along and they can add new functions and so on through libraries. So JavaScript is heavily, heavily dependent upon working with libraries and modules and third-party tooling uh, to supplement what the web platform does on its own. Okay, so let's, let's dive in. Let's write a little bit of this. So the first thing that I want to do is 
um, if I give a line of text, I want to I want to get back a number, um, the count of non white space characters. Okay, so I'm going to write a function. A function takes a line, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to I need a way to replace. So underscore has replace. So the idea with underscore is that I can use this literal underscore or low dash, depending on which version of, uh, there are two versions of, um, there are two versions of this library. It used to be called underscore, and then it got rewritten for performance reasons, and <clears throat> now they call it low dash, but it's the same thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use replace, and you can see how replace works. You give it a source string, and you give it something that you want to look for, and then you give it how, whatever you want to replace. Okay. So I'm going to use it like that to do uh, to do this right now because what I want to do is I want to say I want to take um, the line of text that I'm given, and I want to replace all of the white space characters with nothing. So the easiest way to do that is to do that with a, with a global regular expression. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, look for all of the white space characters, and there can be zero or more of them. And I want to do this globally through the whole string, and I want to replace that with nothing. And then what I'd like to do is, so I could say, you know, uh, var, I'm going to write this in older style JS, so I'll use var, so I'll say something like, um, no white space is equal to this. And then I could say uh, no white space. And um, I could say return, um, let's, re I'll return no white space dot, return no white space dot length. So we need to give this function a name. So I'll call this uh, count characters. So one thing I'm going to ask that you do when you're working on uh, code is that you try and avoid working with variables when you don't need them. So in this code right here, you can see that I am basically storing something in a variable, and then I'm immediately going to return it. So the value of this line of code here would be that it allows me to kind of document my code. I'm giving a name for what I'm doing here. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, no white space in this. Uh, after this is done, I have no white space here. But another thing I could do is I could just say that I'm going to directly return this and I'm going to return dot length like so. Okay, so if you can, if you can avoid variables, programs tend to break where there are variables, because varies necessarily cause your program to vary, or that's where change gets introduced. If you can just use pure functions, like here I'm just taking the return value of a function and I'm gonna use it. Okay, so there's my first function, count the number of characters in a line. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to be able to take um, an array of lines. So I have line, 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 like that. And I want to produce an array of objects where I have the, uh, the line and I also have a count of the number of characters in that line. So I want to, I want to change the way that this thing uh, is structured. Okay, so let's write another function. So function, let's say get stats for lines, and I'm gonna take in lines, which is gonna be this array. Okay, so in low dash, what I this operation that I wanna do here, where I wanna go from I wanna go from a string over to this other object. So let's let's just do that first of all. So let's write a function called process line. So I'm gonna process a single line of text. And so if you give me a line of text, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return back again an object. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, process this line into a new format. And the format is gonna look like the following. So I'm gonna say, um, let's get the count. And the count is going to be equal to calling my previous function, function count those characters in line. 
And I also want to stick the line of text in here it's, as well. So I'm going to say line uh, is equal to line like that. OK, so I have a function. And what I really want to do is I want to call this function on every one of these instances of the line strings that I have in this original array. So we call that operation a map. So if you look up map uh, inside here, lodash has a map function. So you say lodash dot map, you give it the name of whatever it is that you want to uh, iterate across, and then you give it some, you give it a function that will be called on each element of those. So if you, as an example, if I write a function called square, square takes in an, uh, a number and it returns the number times itself. So it squares the number. If I have an array of numbers, I can map each one of these to the square function and it's going to give me back a new array which is going to have these elements uh, squared. So in my case, what I want to do is I want to take a line of text and I want to get back one of these statistics objects. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say, um, you know, var new array is equal to underscore dot map. I'm going to take the lines and then I'm going to pass that into my process line function. And again, if you see yourself doing this and your very next move is to say return new array, just get rid of new array. You don't need that at all. Like you can see oftentimes when you do this, you don't even have a good name for this thing. You're just, you know, you know, you need a variable and you're like, okay, I need a variable. I'll just, I'll call it, you know, variable one. Don't ever do that. So I'm going to return the value here like this. So now I've got my statistics for each one of these, um, each one of these lines. Now, another thing that would be interesting, I now have the ability to get the number of characters in a line. I have the ability to take an array of lines and I can get statistics for each of those lines, like how many characters are in each line. It'd be neat if I could also get, um, write another function where I'm going to, whoops, another function where essentially what I want to be able to do is I want to take in an array of these stats. So I have all these um, statistics for my lines and I want to get back a number, which is the total count of all non white space characters in the whole, in the whole, uh, the whole document. Okay. So let's do that. Let's say function get total count for lines. I pass or, uh, for lines, I'm going to pass in an array of stats. And to do this operation, I want to do something different than before. So before what I did is I had an array of n elements and I wanted to produce another array of n elements, but I wanted to alter the shape of those elements. So I wanted to pass it through a map function so that it, it gets changed. In this case, what I want to do is I want to take an array of elements, in this case, an array of statistics objects. And what I want to do is I want to, I want to boil that down. I want to reduce that down to a single value, to a scalar value. So we call this a reduce. So we call, when we go from one to one, that's a map. And when we go from many to one, we call that a reduce. Okay, so if you look up in Lodash, Reduce also exists. And the way that it works, let's take an example here. So we have uh, an array of numbers, one and two. We want to get the total of these numbers. So what we do is we pass in our collection. Then we pass in a function. And the function is going to get called on each one of these elements. But the function takes two arguments. It takes the current value and it takes the current item that's being processed. So what we're doing here is we're just going to add the current value to the sum that or the total that we are accumulating. So we call this the accumulator. And you can see that the third argument here is the initial value. So this is the value that we want to start from. So we want to start at zero. 
we want to go through each one of these items and we want to add the current item to zero. And then we're going to have one. And then we want to call it for two. So we want to pass in one and two and we want to add those together, add it up. And then at the end, we want to return that value. So we can do the same sort of thing here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say uh, var initial value equals zero. Now, in this case, I am going to use a variable, and I'll tell you why in a second. So I don't want you to get the sense that you can never use variables, uh, but I want you to be careful about when you use them. Okay, so now I'm going to write my uh, accumulator function. So I'm going to say function uh, update total. It takes the current total, and it also takes the current element. So total and the current element. And what it's going to do is it's going to return the total plus the current element. And remember that my current element is one of these stats objects. And the stats object has a property called count. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach in and I'm going to get that count. And I'm going to add that to, um, to the object or to the total rather. So here I'm going to say return underscore dot reduce. I'm going to pass in my stats collection. I'm going to pass in my function update total. And then I'm going to pass in my initial value. So the reason that I think that a variable is kind of useful here is that I could also just have said zero here. And if you are working with people who know this code really well and they know how to, they know how to use uh, you know, they know how to reduce, then it's going to be obvious what zero is. But if you're working on a team with people who haven't seen this before and you want to be really clear about your code. So as much as you can, I want you to not be clever with your code. You're, you're not trying to win a competition by doing tricks on your bike here. This is, you're trying to make your code as readable, as understandable as possible. So if you learn some esoteric function style, one week and you write that code and then six months later you have to come back to this code and you don't even remember how it works, you're gonna frustrate yourself. So here I'll just save our equals zero and down here I'll use that to, uh, to achieve it. Okay, I have one last problem that I need to deal with and that is um, essentially what I want to do is I want to take some long piece of text and I want to get back, um, I, I want to get back an object that has all of my, um, stats and it also has, um, my total. So I want to basically be able to call all of these functions above here and put them into one thing. Okay, so let's say function character count. So this is like my entry point, my main way that I, I use this. So I'm gonna pass in a piece of text like so. And the first thing I need to do is split this up into, into lines. So I need a way to split this. So you look inside Lodash and there's a way to split. So split lets me pass in a string and it lets me pass in something that I want to split it on. And this can be either a regular expression or a string. So in my case, what I want to do is I'd like to split my text and I'd like to split it. I could say, let's split it on new lines. But the problem is I want this to work with Windows or Unix style end of lines. So I'm going to change this. Um, in, you know, so in Windows, we would do R slash N and in Unix, we would just do slash N. So I have, I have two different ways of doing this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a regular expression and I'm going to say it's either going to be uh, slash R slash N or possibly the slash R is not there. It's optional. So I'm going to say, uh, put the question mark there so that it knows Okay, this may or may not be there. And I'm gonna stick this whole thing into um, a variable, or I could just reuse text if I want. I could say text equals. So take the text, split it up like this, or I could say uh, lines if I wanted to make a new variable here. Like so. So after I've done this, what I wanna do is get my stats, convert those lines into stats, which we already have a function for up above. So I'm going to say var stats. 
is equal to get stats for lines, and I'm gonna pass in my lines, like so. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna return an object. Now, another thing I wanna mention about when you're working with JavaScript, the correct place for this brace is right here, not down here. And the reason for that is because of automatic semicolon insertion. So you're gonna, whenever I am marking your code, I wanna see your braces on the same line as the code they go with. If you're writing an if, it goes on the same line as the if, the same line as the function. Because if you write this code, what JavaScript will actually do is this. It'll put a semicolon at the end of return. And so really what you're doing here is you're gonna be uh, ret returning undefined. And then this object will be defined down here, but it'll be unreachable code. So be careful with this. So what I want you to do is I always want you to return like so, semicolon goes here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I want to send back all of the uh, lines and I'll pass back my stats like so. And I also wanna pass back my total. So I'm gonna say get total uh, count for lines and I'm gonna return, or I'm gonna pass in my stats objects like that. Okay, so what we have here is we have our first version of this code and um, we haven't used it yet. So the way we would use it would be, you know, down below here, either in this script or in another script. So for example, just to prove my point, we could have another script and inside this other script, we could say um, var data is equal to character count and we could have some uh, long string here that we want to get that data for and, you know, console.log data. We could do something like that. So in this case, what we've done is you'll notice that I'm using character count as a global. And you'll notice up here that I've been using underscore as a global. So I loaded this script in like so, and it put the low dash, it put it into the global scope. So I don't, I mean, I could also have said window dot underscore, like it just looks ugly, but that's what it means. I'm accessing it on the global object, or you could see sometimes people will say this, this is the global object. So I wanna to talk to you about how we could evolve this code in different ways and how we could use it in different contexts. Uh, right now, we can only use this code in a browser. You couldn't use it in Node, which is a limitation, and I'd like to be able to use it in different, different ways, and I'd like to be able to modernize it and so on. And I also wanna be careful about these globals because everything I'm doing up here has been exposed as a global. So I only really want to expose this one function, this character count function, but I've actually exposed all of my functions. So like get stats for lines, I could call get stats for lines right here. And one of the downsides of exposing everything on the global like this, making everything public, is that people will call that code so if you're maintaining a, a library or you're maintaining a piece of JavaScript, you're gonna have to maintain everything in the public interface because people are gonna start relying on anything that you can call. So if I don't wanna be forced to support these other functions, I need a way to hide them. And I need to be able to just expose this one thing here. So what I really need is I need a way to define a module. Most languages have a way of doing a module JavaScript is unique in that when it was cr first created, it didn't have this. So people had to invent a whole bunch of different ways of doing it. Okay, so let's rewrite this a bunch of ways and I'll just talk you through the evolution of JavaScript and how we would do this. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab this code like so, and I'm going to um, make a new, I'm gonna make a separate file. So this will be version 00.js. And I'll paste this, uh, paste this code in here. And I have, okay, so I have my, uh, I have my code like this. So the, I guess I'll call this, just, just to keep uh, ourselves sane, I'll call this version, version 00, and I will um, make, I'll build on this one. So version, uh, 01.js. Okay, so the first thing I want to do with this code is I want to update it. So the thing about Lodash, Moment, jQuery, what happens with JavaScript and the web in general 
is that these libraries, these popular libraries and these ways of doing things in the community, they start out as a series of what we call ad hoc standards. In other words, these, there's, there's a way that everybody does everything. So over time, people really like Lodash. Like I look today, if you look here, you, this is Lodash. So this is what you're seeing here are how many times Lodash was downloaded from NPM. So you can see on December 13th, it was downloaded like 42 million times from NPM. So people are using Lodash a lot. Like it is, it is a well-loved library. But the funny thing about Lodash is that a lot of it isn't necessary anymore. Lodash still has use cases. There's still pieces of it that are really excellent. But a lot of the things that I just did here have been folded into JavaScript. So what the web does is it takes the best ideas from the community and it pulls them back into the language itself or into the web itself. So let me show you how I would update some of this. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is instead of using Lodash at all, I'm just gonna use um, like line.replace. So it lives on the object. So I'm gonna replace using strings. So a lot of the fancy things that existed in Lodash for arrays and collections and, and strings and so on, they've just been added to the, the built-in types in JavaScript. Another thing I'm gonna do is whenever I have a function like this, like this is a, a pure function where it takes some data and it just turns it into something else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewrite this function. I'm gonna rewrite this as an arrow function. And so I'm gonna say that this is a function. Count characters is a function. And what it does is it takes a line and it does this. It returns the line with all the white space uh, removed and then we get the length of it. And because all I'm gonna do is return, when I'm in an arrow function like this, I don't even need a body. I can just say, I can just do that. So take the line and uh, replace it like so, do this. So I'm gonna inline this and I can do the same thing here. So I could say uh, in this version, I want to define get stats for lines. It takes lines and it's going to return. Okay, so let's think about how we can do this. So the first thing we have to deal with is map. Well, map has been taken from Lodash and it's been added into uh, arrays. So I can rewrite this and I can say lines.map and just pass it the function. So I don't have to pass it two things. I already have the data here. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pass it this function. And what I'm gonna do with this function is I'm gonna clean this function up a bit. So process line, uh, I can say const process line is equal to a function. And what does it do? Well, it returns a new object that's been updated like this. And if that's what your function does, the way that you do this is you just make it an expression. So I just go like this. I say, uh, I'm gonna get rid of the return and get rid of this and pull that over. And so this says, take a line and return a new object that looks like this. And so it, it all gets done in one, in one line. And actually, there's no point in having this as a variable anymore. I might as well just take this and put it right inside here like this, get rid of this. And again, I don't need the return. So now I could just pull this up like this. And I could write something like this. So if I was gonna write this, I might break it into two lines like this. So get stats for lines, takes lines, and it's a function that returns lines.map. So it's gonna return an array. It's gonna take a line and it's gonna produce this new thing. And that's what my function does. Get stats for lines looks like this. So another thing I can do here in newer JavaScript is whenever you are writing line colon line, I don't need to specify that name twice. So you'll often see people do that. They'll just trim off the second one. So this is the same as saying line line where the key name and the value are both line. You can just do it as one like this, okay? 
Okay, so what else can we do? So we've got this function here, get total for lines. Um, let's see if we can uh, clean this up a little bit. So this is again something, I'm just gonna inline it. Get total for lines, takes in stats, and it's going to return, I need to do this reduce. So, okay, so once again, I can say stats.reduce. I get rid of this. So again, you can see that all these really cool things from Lodash have been put inside of inside of this library. Update total, well, let's see if we can clean this up. So const update total is equal to something that takes these two values and it returns that right there. And so this is short enough that I can probably just take this and put it here, get rid of this. And then you can decide, do you want to have this take two lines like this? Um, or do you want to just go and set the initial value there? If you do, you can get rid of the return and write something like that. So which style of JavaScript you prefer? Again, I don't want you to feel like your JavaScript has to look like this and can't look like this. This is perfectly valid JavaScript. It works, it works well. It has worked well for 20 years. This JavaScript here is using some of the convenience things that we have in more modern versions of ECMAScript. And um, you, know, you can start using these things as you feel comfortable with them. How about this one here? So I'm gonna get rid of um, lines is never gonna change. So I'm gonna say this, this is never gonna change. I'm gonna get rid of var and say this. My split, I can just say text.split. And there, I can do something like that, okay? So now I've got a trimmed down version of my code for version one. I have a sort of an updated version of the JavaScript. Okay, so let's write the next version. The version one here, I'm gonna copy this over. The, the thing about this code right now is that I, if I use this code, if I include this code, everything in here, all of these are going to be globals. So what I'd like to do is I would like to only expose this one function right here. So the, ver the first way that this gets solved in JavaScript is through a, um, using a construct where we use what's called an immediately invoked function expression, or we call this thing um, an IIFE, immediately invoked function expression. And the idea is that I'm gonna take this code and I'm going to wrap it in an anonymous function. So let's just start with that. I have an anonymous function like this, everything's inside this function. Now the function has no name because I'm going to immediately invoke the function. I'm gonna call the function right away. So what I have to do is I have to turn this into, um, basically turn this into an expression that gets evaluated right now. And I'm going to immediately invoke the function. So it's kind of like saying function foo, like that. And then on the next line saying foo, like you're calling it right away. But essentially what I'm gonna do is, instead of giving it a name, I'm just gonna get rid of the name and I'm gonna immediately call the function like that, all in one line. So what have we achieved by doing this? Everything in JavaScript ha is going to be defined, all of these variables are gonna be defined within the scope of this function. So we have, we have created, we've closed a function around the outside of, of this code such that none of this internal stuff is gonna leak out. Okay, so down here, for example, if I try and call a character count, I'm gonna get an error because character count isn't exposed outside of that internal function. Okay, so let's improve that. What I'm gonna do here is I'm going to pass in the window object. 
So I'm going to pass in this. I'm going to pass in the global object when I'm in my browser, which is the window. And up here, I'm going to receive that, and I'll just call it global. I could say window. I could call it whatever I want, but I'm going to say I'm going to pass in window, and inside my function, I'm going to have global. So down here, what I'm going to do, the very last thing inside here is I'm going to export my function. So I'm going to say global dot character count is equal to character count, which means that down here I can say window dot character count like that. Or if I want to, I can just use it on the global like that. I can't use count characters, for example, because it hasn't been exposed. Only the, uh, only the bottom function here has been exposed. So now what I've done is I've created a rudimentary um, version of, uh, of a function module. And if you go and take a look at code, like if I go and look at, say, you know, this week we're talking about jQuery. Like if we go and download jQuery, and uh, if I look at this code, let me just open this up in a new tab. Here's the, here's the code for jQuery. Look what it does at the very beginning of the code. Okay, it does an immediately invoked function expression. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see that it automatically calls, well, I don't know which line it happens on here. I'd have to dig around to find where it gets invoked in this file. It'll, it'll go down and, and uh, invoke that function. If you look at uh, Lodash, let me see if I can find, let's look at Lodash. Here's Lodash. Very first thing it does is it wraps it in a function and then at the bottom somewhere it will it will invoke that function. So you can see down here they're using call semantics, but it's the same idea. They're invoking that function and they're passing in this. They're passing in the global, whatever that is. So here we could do the same. You could say we're going to pass in this. And sometimes people will use this as a replacement for window because when you're in Node, in Node there is no window. There is this, but there's no window. So we have an issue where the global scope, JavaScript always has a global scope, but it's not clear what it is in, if you're in a browser or if you are in, uh, in the context of Node. So one of the things that's been added to the language is something called global this. And global this is a, is a way of talking about literally the global this window or whatever it is. Uh, so that you can always know that you have access to it, whether you're in a browser or you're in Node or you're in whatever kind of environment you're in. Okay, let's make another version of this. A uh, new file, this will be version 03. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this code and I'm going to I'm going to rewrite it a slightly different way. So um, I like what the, what we've done here, but I'm going to instead of doing this as my way of exporting it, I'm going to I'm going to make a change. I'm going to say var my module equals this. So this function that I'm going to immediately invoke needs to return something to me. And so what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to return, I'll export my function by doing this. I'll say return an object, and on the object I want to say character count is equal to character count, um, or using what we learned a minute ago, I can also just get rid of that. And so I could say return, return it like so. So now my module is equal to this object right here. And if I wanted to put more things on this, like for example, if I wanted to put count characters on this, I could also add that to it. So now I have, I have a bucket of things that I can export out of this and I can make them available to uh, anyone that wants to use them outside of my module. But I can leave as much as I want private in here so that it's not accessible uh, anywhere else. So these two styles of using a um, using an immediately invoked function expression where you either attach things directly to the global or you export them to a named. So essentially what we're doing is we have a named variable on the on top of this. Like if I was doing this for Lodash, 
what I would do is I would say var underscore equals. Like you might say to yourself, how, when we were doing this version of the code, I'm using something called underscore. Where did that come from? Where it comes from is that they are uh, attaching a whole bunch of functions to an object called underscore. So that's what we're doing here, where you're just attaching all those functions, whatever you want to attach from this internal thing. Part of it's exposed, part of it's not exposed. All right, two more versions I want to take you through. Now, there have been a whole series of attempts to create different module systems. And I'm not going to bother teaching you about some of them because some of them we don't use anymore. So there were some really famous ones, like Require.js was a really famous one. Um, but what happened was that when Node became popular, Node, it, there was no module system for JavaScript. So Node created its own. And we call this common JS, the module system that Node uses. So let's just create a version. Oh, four. Okay, so I'm going to grab, uh, I'll grab the code that I have here like this. And I'll put this inside version four. So when you're working with common JS, um, what, essentially what happens is, Node automatically defines, like you, you never see this, but what Node does is something like this. Uh, let's do let. So let module is equal to an object and the object has exports and it's an empty object like this. And then it also has exports is equal to module dot exports like that. So every one of your, um, when, when you have when you have code like this, what Node essentially does is it wraps it into uh, here. I'll, I'll just I'll write it as I'll write it the way that Node is sort of doing it. So imagine that I've done this. I I define module and I define exports, and then I have a function which gets passed exports, require um, module, and a bunch of other globals: file name, dir name, whatever. So then what it's going to do is it's going to um, take your code, your code gets put inside here. And then what we do in node is we say something like this, we'll say exports dot um, character count is equal to character count. So essentially, I'm doing something almost identical to this, where we're going to um, attach it to an object, but I'm not going to create the object. The object is going to get passed to me, this exports object. Or you'll sometimes see people do module.exports.characterCount equals this. So you can see that exports is basically just this empty object. And what we're doing here is we're attaching things to that object so that others can use it. Now, when you actually use Node, you don't see any of this. This stuff is invisible. So you have to just assume that it's there. So people write their code like this. And so what this says is that the only public part of the module is going to be character count, like that. We only have one piece of this that I'm gonna make available uh, on my object, like like this. And the way that we would use this if we were inside of another file, as you know, is we would say something like const uh, module is equal to require uh, whatever the name of this file is. So this might be slash version uh, 04.js. And then you could get uh, module dot uh, character count like this, like you could reach in and get it. Or another popular way to do this is to just to do what's called object destructing. So I could take this and I could pull the character count, um, pull character count off of the module when I require it. So essentially I'm gonna, I'm gonna say the only part of that object that I care about is this one thing right here, character count. If there was more than one thing, I could define as many of those things as I want. 
So I would then be able to say character count is equal to this. Okay. Now the thing you have to know about this way of loading modules is that it works in Node and it doesn't work in the browser. Because the way that when you say const, um, you know, character count is equal to require whatever, require has to go and load something from the file system. So it has to do this complex algorithm where it goes and it looks for something in node modules, or if it's not in node modules in the current directory, it goes up a level and it looks in that directory for a node modules and it keeps going up. And then it goes and looks in your global cache of node modules, or it looks for a file, but there's no file system in the browser. And the other problem is that if I write code like this, that will work in node. So what this implies is that I have to wait until the module is fully loaded and parsed. So the problem with the common JS style of modules is that you have to block until the file is read and parsed before you can use this. And browsers don't really work that way. Browsers, like it's, it's diff you can do certain things in Node, but in the browser, we don't, we don't wanna block the main thread in order to go and load a module. So what we end up doing here for this is we end up having to, uh, to bundle our code for it to work. So I'll just show you this so you can understand what I'm talking about. I've, I've talked about it a little bit before, but version 04.js. So this is my common JS node module. And what I wanna do is in my package.json, I, I pulled in parcel. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define a script. So I'm gonna have a script called build. And what build is gonna do is it's gonna call parcel and it's going to build um, source slash version 04.js like that. So that means that I can now say npm run build and parcel will read in the dependencies for me and it will create a bundle. So if you notice, I now have a disk directory and I have version 04.js. And if you look at this, it's all been, um, it's all been minified together. So what I'm gonna do is I'll do this again, but I won't, do, I won't build it for development. I'll just do a development version of it. So my development version is gonna be dev and I'll say parcel source version 04.js. So I'm gonna say npm run dev. And it's built this file right here. So essentially what you can see here is that it has created this like uh, function around all of my code. Like let me, let's find our code. Somewhere deep, deep, deep down in here is my code. My code lives right here. So you can see what it did is it created like a fake file. So it says version 04.js is, and it has this function here. And so the function, here's all my code, and it's rewritten my code. You'll notice that it's rewritten my code, for example, to use var instead of uh, what I did before. You'll notice that my arrow functions are gone. So it's actually transpiled my code, or it's made my code so it'll work in an older version of JavaScript. So I can write my code in modern versions of JavaScript, and it will automatically figure out how to make this work in older versions of JavaScript. So that's an interesting effect too. So this has bundled my, um, my code for me. You'll notice that uh, I have this export down here. And when I wanna use this, it's going to essentially create require. So it's, it's, it's giving its own version of require to make this possible, okay? So if I wanna do this in the browser, if I wanna use common JS in the browser, I can't wait on a synchronous require. I have to bundle it so that all of the data that I need is already there. It, Cause you can't, you can't block on the file system. Okay, I got one more version for you. So version five, uh, of this, I'm gonna I'm gonna take version four and I'll copy it over. And so the last version I have for you 
is called, this is, I'm gonna write what's called an ES module. So these, there came a point where the JavaScript language, where the committee that oversees this, the ECMAScript standardization committee said, we, we have all these different ways of bundling our code and all these invented ways, and we have common JS and etc. What we need to do is we need to we need to make a version of uh, modules that work standard in JavaScript. So what they came up is they came up with this thing called ES or native modules, and this is the the new way that we do modules in JavaScript. So these things work in the browser and. Until recently, they didn't work in Node, and they don't work super smoothly in Node yet, but it's getting better. So let me show you what, what you do to write an ES module. So in CommonJS, in CommonJS, we do this. We say module.exports equals like, like that, okay? When you do an ES module, what you do instead is you say that you want to, you want to export something. So you say export, uh, default character count. Now, if I wanted to use this, what I would do is I would say uh, in my in some other file, I would say import character count from version 05.js like that. And the reason that I can I can do this, I can say character count, or if I wanted to, I could call it count. I could say import count from this. That would also work. The reason that would work is because I'm exporting a default function or a default object, or I'm saying this is the default thing you get when you uh, import this. But I could also have said, I want to export, um, you know, this function here. So let's, I could even do it up here. Export this function character count like that. Okay. And now if I wanted to use this because there's nothing that is default exported, I would say something like, I want to import character count from this. So in node, I would say uh, const character count is equal to require version 04.js like this, right? So very, very similar, but different. So one of the things that the ES module system gives you, it gives you this idea of a default export. So let's just rewrite my code again so that it's clear. So down here, I'm gonna say export default character count. So CommonJS doesn't have this com concept of a default export. So that's one of the differences. Another difference is that these modules are designed to be asynchronously loaded. So in a browser, what I can do, if I was gonna include this in a browser, I can say, I wanna load a script. The type of this script is equal to a module and the source is equal to version uh, 05.js, okay? Uh, you know, say .js, or you'll see some people, some people will name their files mjs, like that to say that this is a module that needs to be loaded. So it's possible in the browser to load these modules natively like this uh, in order to be able to, uh, to work with them. So if I, I'm gonna just clean this code up slightly. So if my version five is gonna have an ES module export like this, this is version five. And what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna, let's, let's update my package.json. Let's do this for version five, just to show you the difference. Version five, I'll save this. And I'm, I'm actually, um, I want to make one more change because I want to show you sort of all of this in one. I'm going to add, I'm going to tell Parcel to also do a global version of this global character count. So let me rerun this. So and dev. Okay, here's version five. 
So Parcel has created this, and I wanna show you what Parcel writes. Take a look at this code right here. So what a bundler does is it, it basically recreates everything that I just showed you, the entire history of all of those module systems. It's been, it's created every version of them in one. So you can see, for example, that because I gave it a global name, my global name up here, let's find my global, global name, uh, you can't see it being called, but essentially what it's doing is it's going to get this name right here, character count, like that. So what this code says is this at global name equals main export. So that's like saying window dot character count is equal to my function like that. So it is creating the global version of it that I could use in a script. It writes a version of this that would work with require.js, which I didn't show you, but we talked about briefly. You can see that it's writing a version of this that would work for node. So uh, I could say um, type of exports equals this and module.exports equals main. So you can see that that's working. And it's also gonna produce a, an ES module. So it has an ES module version of this too. So it has a default export that I can use um, as well. So it's like, it gives me this bundle of code, which will work in every scenario. I could use this all over the place. So just to show you what I mean, if I were to, I'll just finish with this. Uh, let's do uh, build version 05. I'm gonna get rid of this and I'll say npm run build. Okay, so let's, let's go into node. If I said require um, dist slash version 05.js, let's see what it gives me. So it gives me back something with a default property. And the default property is that, that ES module that I was just telling you about. So if I were to say dot default, I get back a function and the function is my function that I could call. Um, so, you know, we could write a little bit of code to, you know, to use this. Um, I, I think I, I'm not going to write it for you now. I'll put it up on GitHub, some simple code to go through and work with it. But the main thing that I wanted, I wanted you to understand is in the next video, I want to show you working with these different libraries. And when you go to work with them, there's all different ways to include them and load them. And it's super confusing when you're getting started because there's all these different versions. And it, it, it's not clear what you're meant to do. And all of them work, but they have different trade-offs. And why would you pick one way over another? So I wanted to, I wanted to start with this where you saw how these you saw how these module systems evolved and, and the problems that it was trying to solve. So that when you encounter this in React or in Angular uh, and you're pulling in code from Node into a React app, which sounds crazy, but it's amazing. So you've got code that works on the server side and in React or and in Angular. How do you combine those things together? You have to understand the difference between common JS and ES modules and things that are exported on the global, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, hopefully I haven't confused you. Hopefully this has been clear. If it's not, please reach out and ask me some questions. In the next videos, I'll make use of what we just did here.